Um, good, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, our spotlight session. Uh, we have two very exciting talks and uh, two discussions. Um, we'll start with uh, Will's uh, presentation. Uh, it's a paper that answers this question. When is assortment optimization optimal? Will, take it away. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for attending. And as Ozan said, I'm very excited to uh, try to at least answer the question of when is assortment optimization optimal? All right. So let me begin by telling you what the assortment optimization problem is. Um, it can be practically phrased as um, when I'm a retailer and I have a set of substitute products like these sneakers, I'm trying to decide um, which subset of all the sneakers possible in the world should I carry? Should I offer in my store or my online store? And so this problem can be thought of as an exchange between a seller and the buyer. The retailer is the seller. Um, and an important property of assortment optimization is the assumption that the items have fixed prices. So I'm not allowed to change the prices of these sneakers, but I can control which one the buyer might buy um, because I choose a subset of these sneakers to place on the shelf or carry. And these are substitute products. The buyer wants at most one pair. Um, they have a priori some ranking over the sneakers that, that they might want. And so let's say the buyer's ranking is the $150 pair over the $250 pair over the $89 pair. So if that's their ranking, they're going to see this selection and they're going to choose the $150 pair, which is their favorite. The buyer is happy. But the seller does have some control here. Um, they can, in fact, increase their revenue in this particular example by hiding the lower priced option. Here, the buyer will only see their second choice um, and pay $250. So, uh, of course, this isn't good for all buyers. Um, there could be other buyers from the population who have a ranking where they're not willing to purchase the $250 pair. They only want to purchase the $150 pair that's cheaper. So then they would have lost market share to these customers. So generally, this is a non-trivial problem. Um, it's been studied extensively in revenue management on solving for the optimal assortment. And essentially, you're addressing this trade-off, where if you carry a wider selection, then you capture a greater market share. But if you capture a smaller assortment, then you reduce what's called the cannibalization of the higher price options from the lower price options. So very well studied, um, practical problem. And I was telling this problem to some economist friends of mine. And what they asked is, why should the seller restrict to assortments in this exchange with the buyer? Um, in their mind, it was like assortments are kind of like these uh, shadows on the wall, where uh, for those of you who have seen the Plato's cave analogy, where this is a very specific way for a seller to sell these substitute items with fixed prices. But maybe there's a whole world out there of different ways in which this exchange could happen between a buyer and a seller. And um, actually, I'll give you an example that arises in practice, which is the example of selling these sneakers. They're actually from a website called N Clothing, where they use fixed price lotteries. And how fixed price lotteries work is each of the sneakers, they have a fixed price. Um, and the buyer can join whichever lotteries they want. And when you join, you have to agree to pay the fixed price if you happen to quote, win one of these sneakers. And I should just emphasize, this is sort of a new thing that's different from traditional lotteries that kind of, uh, those of you who might have seen these price line price breakers, uh, they entice you to buy the lottery because the price is cheaper. Or for those of you uh, like myself in New York, you like to see Broadway shows, um, you can have cheaper prices for Broadway tickets through the lottery. But one important thing here is the prices are never changing. You're offering these lotteries and the only reason the customer is choosing them is because they have no other option. They can only get these sneakers by joining the lottery. And one reason why a firm might wanna do so is to protect the brand value of these, their premium products. 
So that's one example of a selling mechanism in the assortment environment that still doesn't need to change prices, fits exactly with assortments and provides an alternate way of selling. So the research question here is, what is the best method for selling items in this environment, given the information and incentives? So just to summarize this general strategic exchange between the buyer and the seller, these are the salient features. Like I said, each items have a fixed, I'm just gonna call it benefit, but you can think of it as profit or revenue. Um, basically the seller gets that amount of benefit for selling if the buyer chooses that item. The buyer wants at most one option, but the buyer's ranking is private, but distributionally known. Um, this distribution captures the general preferences of the population. And importantly, in this problem, the buyer's incentives are unaligned with the sellers. The seller wants the buyer to choose the item with the fixed highest price. But the buyer wants their first choice, which very well might not be the pair of shoes with the highest price. And importantly, the buyer has an outside option. They can go somewhere else to buy shoes. So the seller can't just say, oh, my mechanism is I'm, I'm going to dictate to you this $250 pair and you have to buy it. So there's a strategic interchange here between how the seller should make shoes available to maximize the chances of getting the buyer to choose the highest price one while still making sure the buyer doesn't go to the outside option too frequently. All right, so let me now give you an outline for the rest of the talk. Hopefully I've explained the question clearly. Um, so generally, if we want to study what is the best way to sell something, this is sort of the purpose of mechanism design. I'm going to try to capture all selling methods I could possibly do given the strategic uh, incentives of the buyer using mechanism design. And I'll first show you that assortments are generally suboptimal. Um, then I'll do a trivia break. Uh, the most important part of the talk. And then um, I'll prove a general result that says assortments, they're not optimal for any distributions, but if you use a Markov chain choice model to model uh, the customers, which is commonly used, um, Antoine has some very pioneering work in this regard, then actually assortments are optimal. And then time permitting, um, I'll talk about the proof techniques and also some extensions. All right. So let me get into the formulation. So let me first tell you the environment, right? So this is the environment that's true regardless of whether you have an assortment or a mechanism. Um, I'm gonna assume a universe of items denoted by N. Each item J has a fixed price. The buyer has a ranking, uh, which I'm gonna denote using a list. The list is the ordered subset of items that they rank above the outside option, given in decreasing order of preference. Um, the items that the buyer ranks below the outside option, the order is not going to matter. So I'm assuming that list is drawn from a known distribution D, which is a standard assumption in assortment optimization. And so an assortment is the following method of selling in this environment. It's, I choose a subset S of items to put on my shelf. And then the revenue I collect is the expectation over lists drawn from the population. And this is just a fancy way to say, each buyer is gonna choose the item J, if any, which is their most preferred uh, in their list among the items available in S. All right, so more generally, uh, so, okay, uh, I'm gonna now show you that assortments can be suboptimal. I'll show you an example of a lottery that I showed you before that can outperform assortments, which shows this is a non-trivial question. So this is the simplest example I can think of that demonstrates this. I have four, four items. Um, item A is the premium item that the seller is trying to sell with a price of two. All the other items have a price of one. And the buyer's list is drawn uniformly from one of six types. So each of them have a probability of one sixth. Uh, let me just explain this a bit. All six subsets of size two are possible, but importantly, it's always in reverse alphabetical order, which means the expensive item, when it's on the buyer's list, it's their second choice, not their first choice. So, that's the instance. 
let's now see what's the best we can do with an assortment. Um, we always want to offer the highest price item. If we offer only that, um, then the first three possible realizations of the list, they're going to buy item A. I'm going to collect $2 from the first half of the market, but I'm going to collect nothing from the second half. My expected revenue is six over six. Um, I can play with increasing the assortment. As you can see, I'm going to increase the market captured, but there's going to be cannibalization where if I include item B, then type BA no longer pays me two. They no longer buy the expensive item. Um, and you can play around with different assortments. If I offer two cheaper items, then I capture the full market, but there's even more um, cannibalization. And hopefully it's not too hard to convince yourself that the best you can do with an assortment on this example is seven over six. All right, so I haven't fully defined what's a feasible mechanism yet, but let me tell you an example of a lottery that I think hopefully we can all agree is reasonable, which is the following. It's a top two lottery. In this lottery, the buyer can submit up to two different items and you get each of the items you submit with probability a half. Importantly, if you only submit one item, then you get that item with probability a half and with the other half of the time, you get nothing. So I claim that intuitively, if this is the mechanism, regardless of which type you are as a buyer, you want to submit both items. Um, if your type is BA, you can't really benefit by only submitting A because you still only get your, uh, sorry, you can't benefit by only submitting B and not submitting A because you still only get your first choice B half the time. And the other half of the time you get nothing, which by definition is worse than receiving A, your second choice. So assuming both all the buyers are gonna submit both items to the lottery, um, then I'm gonna make an average of 1.5 from the first three buyers, an average of one from the latter three buyers for an expected revenue of 7.5 over six. And so generally assortments in fact are not the best you can do. And uh, essentially what this example has accomplished is I've managed to capture the full market while minimizing the cannibalization of the higher priced item. Okay, so this is sort of the motivating example for this whole work. Um, so hopefully that was clear. Now let me try to formalize what are all the possible selling mechanisms I'm gonna allow. And it will include the lottery I just showed you. So, I'm going to uh, characterize all the possible selling protocols using a direct revelation mechanism, which works as follows. Um, for any type L that the buyer could report, I'm going to have a variable XJ of L that denotes the probability of receiving item J if you report list L. Um, one minus the sum over J of XJ of L is the probability that you receive nothing. So remember, the buyer can get at most one item because these items are substitutes. All right. Um, and then, so my revenue is just the expected amount I collect given the randomness in the mechanism and the random type. And finally, I need to have a constraint of incentive compatibility under which I can assume that buyers will truthfully report their list. And what this means is if my true list is L, then what the constraint says is the my preference for the lottery I receive. Um, so if I report L, you can think of this vector over J as the distribution of items or the lottery I get when I report L. So I have to prefer the lottery from truthfully reporting over the lottery that I would get from telling any lie L prime. And this has to be true for every pair L and L prime. And so I, okay, so I've almost finished the specification of the problem. I should say um, one thing I like about this model is that this is really the only part in addition that I need to define that isn't already defined in assortment optimization. So there are other models and other ways to increase revenue in assortment optimization. For example, if I change the prices, but then I have to define how the buyer reacts when I change the price. Here, the only thing I have to specify is how the buyer reacts when there might be a randomized outcome. 
So now I'm going to define this preference ranking over lotteries. Um, a quick thought will actually show it's not obvious because as a buyer, do I want to like always get my second choice or get my first choice half the time and third choice half the time? So uh, I'm going to now provide the definition that we adopt in this work. This was pioneered in the work of Gibber in 1977. It can be called strong truthfulness, which is I impose on the mechanism that truth telling has to maximize the buyer's probability of receiving one of their K most preferred items simultaneously for all K. So regardless if you're just trying to maximize your chances of getting your favorite or maximize the chances of getting one of your two favorites or three favorites, doesn't matter. You still want to tell the truth. Um, for those of you familiar with this area, there is an equivalent formulation, which is given any cardinal utilities consistent with the ranking you report, this constraint says that truthful aid, truth telling maximizes your expected utility. So I'm imposing a strong constraint on the mechanism. Um, let me give you a few reasons for this. So one is, okay, I think it's somewhat standard. Two is one thing about this definition is it implies ex post individual rationality, which means that there's no probability under which the buyer is going to be forced to buy an item not on their list. Um, an alternate formulation you could think of is like, I ask you to tell me a precise number on how much you value each option, and I only promise you that truth telling maximizes your expected value. Um, under such a mechanism, you could get an item that you don't even want to buy, like you would rather have nothing, uh, and then you know you can like cancel your credit card. Uh, and another way to interpret this is the mechanism is being friendly to the buyer. You don't have to figure out your precise uh, cardinal values for the options. You just have to report your ordinal ranking correctly. And as long as you do so, you can't really regret it. You did the best you possibly could um, for the mechanism. So you just have to report a ordinal ranking. You don't have to figure out your precise values. And while you might think, okay, I've restricted the mechanism so much, um, I'll show you that there's still a rich space of mechanisms that satisfy this strong truthfulness condition. So top K lotteries, um, lotteries biased in favor of more preferred items, uh, assortments obviously satisfy this, and then, uh, yeah. Okay, so given that formulation, uh, let me now uh, form, formally state the problem. So I'm just gonna introduce the following notation, uh, given a list uh, L uh, for any index K, which is at most its length, I'm gonna let L one sub K uh, one decay, L sub one decay, denote the set of my K most preferred items. So I'm just gonna reformulate everything I said as an LP. So basically this is all the constraints on the mechanism. Um, the first set of constraints are the strong truthfulness constraints, which let me just go through again. This says that if my true type is L, then the probability that I receive one of my K most preferred items, which is uh, from truth telling, which is this quantity on the left, is greater than or equal to the probability that I receive one of my K most preferred items from telling some lie L prime, which is this quantity on the right. So I can think of this as a polyhedron in some high dimensional space, which is my space of all feasible mechanisms. And so mechanism design, the problem is just maximize uh, this objective function over this polytope. Um, we actually show that deterministic mechanisms correspond exactly to integer points in this polyhedron, which correspond to assortments. So it's just the same optimization problem where I'm doing integer programming instead of linear programming. And so the question we're asking in this paper can just be, be stated as, when does opt S over the integer points equal opt X over the entire polytope? And so one thing I want you to notice is that P doesn't actually depend on any parameters of the problem. It doesn't depend on the distribution D or the prices that you give me RJ, which is, which is the entire input to the assortment optimization problem. So 
only the objective function depends on the specific uh, instance of assortment optimization you give me. And basically, um, the question is, when does the objective guarantee an integer optimal solution, which corresponds to an assortment? So generally, um, P isn't going to be an integral polytope because I showed you an example where the unique optimal solution was non-integer. But basically, what I'm going to derive are conditions we can impose on the distribution D such that for any prices RJ, um, the adversary sort of like, even if they set the RJs, they can't twist the objective in a direction that exposes one of these non-integer extreme points of the polytope P. All right, so let's take a quick uh, trivia break now, where I'm going to then position this problem in the literature. Okay, so uh, I'm showing you a comic from uh, Math of Bad Drawings. So how this works is this is a Venn diagram, where uh, each circle represents a characteristic. So uh, you can type in the chat or unmute yourself. Can anyone think of something that's loved by Canadians, physically punishing, but doesn't risk your teeth? All right, in the interest of time, uh, I'm gonna proceed. Uh, so uh, the answer given here is Canada. Uh, so I see hockey. Uh, okay, so keep that in mind maybe. All right, next one. Uh, loved by Canadians may cost you your teeth, but not physically punishing. Maple syrup, wow. Okay, Jacob Feldman is, yeah, well, both on a roll. Okay, last one. Uh, physically punishing may cost your teeth, not loved by Canadians. I know Yahua is Canadian, so maybe Yahua will know this one. Um, so I'm also Canadian, which is why I like this comic. Uh, the answer given in the comic here is bad dentistry. Um, I think I've also heard the answer is boxing. So. Okay, so then the final question is what's in the middle, uh, and someone, Jake, Jake already typed this, is ice hockey. So for those of you who don't know, um, Canadians like myself love hockey. It's, finish, it's physically punishing, and also, if you've ever seen a picture of a hockey player, they don't have their teeth um, because the puck has knocked it off. Uh, so fortunately, I still have all my teeth. Um, I wasn't allowed to play hockey as a kid, which is like a deprived childhood in Canada. Um, anyways. The reason why I wanted to show you this comic is because now I'm going to position uh, my work using characteristics like a Venn diagram and contrast it with large streams of literature. So Bayesian mechanism design is the general idea of trying to maximize revenue given a prior on the preference distribution of your population. Um, but this area generally, uh, it always assumes that pricing is a decision variable. It doesn't assume fixed prices. Um, assortment optimization, the base problem I've already talked about, uh, that would go over here in the Venn diagram where we're doing depend, uh, optimization over a prior. We are doing um, no payments, but we're not doing mechanism design. And finally, there's also this large area of mechanism design without money, uh, which has long studied possibly randomized allocations over ordinal lists. Um, but generally results in this area are prior free. Most of the segment celebrated mechanisms here, um, they don't optimize over a prior, they try to identify characteristics under which you have like a singularity type result where there's only one feasible solution. So um, our work lies in the middle here, uh, we introduce mechanism design to the revenue optimization problem. That's classically assortment optimization. Uh, our difference with Bayesian mechanism design is no payments. Uh, and our difference with the mechanism design without money is we're doing optimization over a Bayesian prior, uh, given a feasible set that contains multiple mechanisms. Um, I should say from a practical point of view, generally uh, pricing using lotteries and loot boxes has also been recently extensively studied in our area. So this is just a very abbreviated literature review, but uh, hopefully this explains some positioning uh, for this problem, which I do believe is very new. All right, so in the remaining five minutes I have, I'm going to try to give you a quick flavor of the proof technique and explain the main result for Markov chains and then conclude. So 
Uh, generally, the proof technique is that, okay, we're trying to analyze this LP that I showed you, and we want to show that under certain assumptions about the distribution D, the distribution over lists D, they're always existent in integer optimal solution. Um, unfortunately, this problem is generally not easy to think about. At least I haven't successfully been able to, you know, have a good understanding of characterization, say, of optimal solutions for different instances. So our proof technique is to upper bound this LP using a sequence of relaxed problems. Um, and the key is, if we uh, relax it in a certain way uh, using non-increasing functions, which I'm going to skip the details of, we can show that you actually have integrality after you relax it. So we know that before the polytope was an integral, but you can write a related relaxed polytope that is integral, which makes the problem easier to think about. And then there's a second relaxation, which allows us to think about the problem essentially as an optimal stopping problem where you can think about the list as being sequentially generated by a probabilistic tree and you're moving down the tree and you're asking the question how well can i do through optimal stopping um, and so basically the hope is that even after relaxing to this optimal stopping problem which is a lot more powerful than the original mechanism design we can still show that for a fairly general class of distributions D, that the best solution on this optimal stopping problem is no better than something that corresponds to an assortment. Um, so I'm going to skip the details. Uh, so now I'll explain the main result that assortments are optimal for Markov chain choice models. So I won't have time to detail what Markov chain choice models are, but it's a specific family of list distributions that satisfies a memorylessness property. And here's a quick intuition of why assortment optimization is optimal for Markov chains. The proof given the sequence of relaxations is actually very easy. Um, basically, when you solve the corresponding optimal stopping problem for Markov chain choice models on the tree diagram, it actually ends up being equivalent to optimal stopping on the original Markov chain itself, which is well understood. Um, there always exists an optimal stationary policy, which corresponds to an assortment. Uh, done. Assortments are optimal for Markov chain. And so just to summarize the overall proof technique, obviously that was very fast given the time constraint, but we introduce a sequence of relaxations where we start with a mechanism design problem that's kind of messy. We end with an optimal stopping problem that's easy to understand. And then we show that opt phi, which is the optimal optimal stopping value, is at most opt s, and therefore the whole hierarchy collapses and assortments are optimal. Um, I should say, uh, we also show that for non-Markov chain choice models, uh, assortments can still be optimal. And this requires a more complicated uh, sufficient condition uh, and also a more complicated definition of the stopping calls. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna end on the half hour. So, okay, in the last two minutes, so let me just, um, okay, I'm gonna skip this slide. Um, so we also have some other results in the paper. Uh, we derive suboptimality gaps when the list distribution doesn't fall into our sufficient condition and is not a Markov chain choice model. Um, and so uh, we actually show a correspondence between feasible mechanisms and submodular functions, uh, which defines a class of mechanisms. But uh, I'm going to skip all this and then we derive some um, suboptimality gaps. One thing I'll end with is that even if you don't buy uh, mechanisms and lotteries for selling items at all, and you don't, um, you don't care about lotteries, even if you just care about solving assortment optimization, uh, one thing to come out of this work is that the mechanism design LP we can actually show is a, a strictly tighter relaxation than the best known LP relaxation for assortment optimization under the distribution of rankings choice model. So even if you don't want to use mechanisms in practice, I believe that the concept of mechanisms, which gave rise to this tighter LP, could be useful for speeding up the solution of assortment optimization. Okay, so let me conclude.
So summary of our main contributions. On the modeling side, we provide a mechanism design formulation of assortment optimization that tries to capture all the different ways you can sell fixed price uh, items that are substitutes. We show assortments are suboptimal in general, but on the technical side, we show that assortments are optimal for the well-studied multinomial logit and Markov chain choice models. Um, we also have a more general sufficient condition and some other results. And finally, I want to end with, uh, I think a major implication of this work that I'm very excited about is the large literature that our field has studied on assortment optimization actually has a greater significance than we appreciated before. Um, because uh, we're not just computing optimal assortments, we're computing essentially the economic limit of how much money the seller can make in these environments, at least when we restrict to MNL and Markov chain choice models. So uh, next time I talk to my economist friends who said that, oh, we're just optimizing over this class of selling methods that correspond to shadows on the wall. Uh, and you know, you think your general selling methods are better, but actually um, if you have a Markov chain choice model, there's actually an even bigger world out there. And uh, the bigger world is actually just dominated by these shadow horses and dogs that correspond to the assortments that we started with. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Phil. This was awesome. I learned interesting stuff about lotteries, assortments, and Canadians. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to turn to, I have a question, but I'll just turn it over to Antoine to, um, to, so that we are on time and we'll continue the discussion. And after that, time permitting, we can have a Q&A. &A. And um, after the session is over, Hopefully we'll all go back to the uh, virtual platform and we can also continue the discussion there. Antoine, um, all right. we can look forward to hearing your discussion. We can see your slides. You can see my slide and you can hear me well? Yep. Okay, so thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to discuss this, this paper. So what I'll do is I'll first share some uh, things that I really liked about the papers. And then I'll try to focus on uh, one intuition that I think is, is, is comes, com, comes out of this work and that's the connection to optimal stopping problem. And especially how this work is able to generalize some results that were learned from, from the Markov chain. Um, obviously what I'm gonna say here is, is a bit biased because I've done some work on the Markov chain. And then I'll end with some thoughts and future directions. So, I think I, I'll just start with what Will said at the end, which is what I, what I really liked about this paper is that it frames the assortment optimization problem as a special case of a selling mechanism. And, and as such, it is a great message for all of us working in assortment optimization because it means that what we've been doing is actually, you know, has a broader scope than what we initially thought. Um, and that some, sometimes, in, in fact, the assortment optimization um, is optimal. What I also like is I think this mixing of uh, mechanism design and assortment optimization, which I think is part of a recent uh, you know, trend, which I think will, could be quite fruitful, uh, both from a practical side, wherein uh, on, in the assortment optimization literature, we've mostly ignored uh, this sort of uh, incentives problem. And uh, whereas this auction theory literature has largely ignored the substitution effect. And I think there are some interesting uh, you know, uh, applications that can come out of this mix, uh, but also from a theoretical perspective, I think the interplay between these two effects actually is quite challenging. And I think this, this makes it for, 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 for good research opportunities. Um, and the paper is very rich. It has a lot of independent, almost in, in results that could be of independent interest. The one that I'll focus on, which I think is really interesting is uh, the connection to optimal stopping problem. And in particular, uh, a unifying property uh, an interesting unifying property of various rank-based model. And the reason I like this is that I, I feel like recently we've been proposing a lot of different models without really trying to understand the connections between each other. Um, and I think this, this property that, uh, that is derived in this work is a first step towards better understanding the connections between different choice models. As an example, for instance, it shows, the paper shows that Nested logit is not a special case of Markov chain, which to the best of my knowledge was not known before. Uh, so in this, in, the, in, this, in, this, in, in this paper, uh, Will shows that, you know, some nested logit cannot be captured by Markov chain, which I think is an interesting result uh, on its own. 
Okay, so what, are we gonna, what am I gonna talk about? So the, the key research question is, when is a sorbonne optimization problem equivalent to optimal stopping with monotone rule? And this was, it was known that for Markov chain model, this was the case, and this is mainly due to the Markov property. And the interesting question that the paper answer is, can we come up with a broader class of models under which this equivalence hold? And, 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 and this is what I'm gonna to try to give you some intuition on. And I, I was glad that we uh, could not get to it, so I have something interesting uh, additional to share. So let me go back to a Markov chain model, um, where here the problem uh, of a sort one is, is to pick uh, one state of the Markov chain, which is a product. And when you do that, basically the, st the state becomes absorbing in a Markov chain sense. The equivalent uh, sort of optimal stopping problem is one where you have, you're randomly walking on this Markov chain and at each step you need to decide whether you want to stop and collect that revenue or carry on. Okay. Um, one interesting property that was known for the Markov chain model, which actually could be useful in solving this problem, is the following uh, revenue decomposition. What you can actually do is you can decompose the revenue of, um, of a given subset as a sum of two revenues. Uh, one is the original revenue. The second one is an adjusted revenue. And what this allows basically is to compute the revenue of a given assortment iteratively. So here, for instance, let's say I want to compute the revenue I generate from these three products. What I can do is I can compute the revenue I get when I only offer five, and then compute the revenue I get when I offer two and three on this new Markov chain where I have removed product five. And importantly, what I've done is I've adjusted the revenues. The intuition for, for this adjusted revenues is basically what you want to do is you want to avoid double counting of double counting. Because in, in general, this revenue function is only sub-additive, right? If you were to compute the revenue of R2 and R3 on the original Markov chain, you would be double counting the revenue. And so what you want to do is you want to say that whatever, when I offer a product here, I'm, I'm getting the revenue, but I have to account for the revenue that was already accounted on this first Markov chain. And, and one way to do that is to compute adjusted revenues, um, which can be computed as follow. You have the original revenue, and then you discount the expected revenue that you get from S1, which is the, the, the first subset, when you start at I. And what we can show is that under a Markov chain, this decomposition holds. And in particular, you can use this decomposition to compute uh, efficient algorithm for the assortment optimization and, and also for the constraint assortment optimization. Okay. All right, so now let's move on. And, and I wanna try to extend this intuition and see how Will was able to extend this intuition to uh, distribution over rankings. So now, Let's move away from Markov chain and let's assume that you have a distribution of a ranking, right? So the customer preferences are given by a distribution of the rankings. Now you can formulate the same optimal stopping problem whereby you are basically, you know, randomly, you know, traversing, you know, one of these ranking and at each step you need to decide whether you want to stop and collect this revenue or continue. Now you see here that the, 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 the difficulty is that a, a stopping rule may be history dependent in this case, right? Because you may wanna to decide to stop on certain lists, but not on other. Now this never happened in the, Mark, in, the, in the Markov chain model because of the Markovian property, right? When you get to a certain state, whatever happened before didn't matter. And what that means is a given stopping rule cannot be mapped to an assortment anymore. Right, because the way that you would map a stopping rule to an assortment is basically by saying every time you stop at a product, this is one product that you need to put in your assortment. Now, for some product, you may stop sometimes and not, you know, you, you may stop only sometime. And therefore, for this product, it's not clear whether or not you want to include them in your assortment. Right. Nevertheless, what is what is nice about about uh, what what Will was able to show is that despite this, this decomposition idea can be extended. Right, so you could still decompose the revenue as a sum of two revenues, uh, where here I'm taking a particular stopping rule. And, and here, just to illustrate the point, for some product I've select, I'm stopping all the time. For some product, I'm not stopping all the time. Right? For instance, for three, I may stop you know, on this ranking, but not on this one. 
And so what you can do is you can write the revenue of this, an assortment, which, which are the product where you always stop, plus some adjusted revenue on these products, on the remaining product, where you are still not, you know, it's, it's still not an assortment because you, you may still stop only sometimes. But importantly, what I've done is I've adjusted the revenues and this, the expression of the revenue naturally extends that of Markov chain. Um, what's interesting is and important is that the revenue now actually depends on the history, right? You may adjust the product, the, the revenue differently for different product. And so now the question is, um, can under which model, under which distribution of a ranking, can we map an optimal solution to a Markov chain? And, and you could see that this is going to be tied to a property of these adjusted revenue. So for the Markov chain, all the adjustments were the same. Um, and what you, what you want to do is you want to have a property that allows you to control what happens on these adjusted revenues for different rankings. And let me illustrate this in a very special case. And the, 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 the example I'll, I'll take is basically the, the, the first thing that, it, that goes beyond the Markov chain, which is a mixture of a Markov chain and a singleton. Right? So here is a choice model where you know, you, with some probability, you choose according to a Markov chain. And with some probability, you're only interested in product two. Okay, and let's consider the optimal stopping problem on this choice model. So what can, there are only two things that, that can go wrong. The first thing is that you may choose to stop here, but not here, right? So the only problematic product on this example is, is product two, right? So in this example, so you may, so suppose you decide to stop here, but not there. Uh, in this case, there is a property of those stop of this stopping rule, which is trying to encode this, the IC of the mechanism design constraint, which says that uh, the stopping rule must, must be monotone. So in that case, so this, this is not possible. So if you decide to stop when you didn't see anything, in particular, you'll have to stop at this one. So this is not possible just by, by the space of, of uh, possible rule. The interesting case is what happens in this case, where you decide to stop in the Markov chain, but not here. What's, what happens here is if you, if you do the adjustment of the revenue, you can see that the adjusted revenue of the singleton is never gonna change. Because remember that when you adjust the revenue of the singleton, you discount for the expected revenue starting from this point. But after this, there is no extra revenue. So the, the, the revenue never decreases. That means that in this particular example, whatever adjustment I make, the adjusted revenue of this node is always gonna be lower than this one. And what that implies is that if you decide to stop here, you'll always decide, you'll always also stop there. And I think this is, this is quite really nice that you see that this naturally imposes a dominance relationship on the adjusted revenue. So in particular, this class of model, which are mixture of Markov chain and singletons is one example of a model which goes, which is more general than Markov chain model, but under which that equivalence holds. And I think it's quite neat because it, it shows you that basically what you want is some kind of dominance relationship in those adjusted revenue. And this is what uh, Will formalizes in the paper. Uh, this is a property called history dominance, which basically has to do with the fact that you want to be able to control how the adjusted revenues uh, change with respect to each other. So um, I'll just end with some thoughts and perhaps questions for Will slash interesting future directions. So the first one is, I think, so as I said, I think what, you know, I think what I like the most about this, this paper is this history dominance relationship because it, it unifies different choice models. Um, and what I was wondering is for the Markov chain model, this externality adjusted revenue reveals an adjusted revenue ordered property for the optimal assortment. So you could use this adjusted revenue uh, to compute the optimal assortment. And I was wondering whether something similar could happen for history monotone models and whether this idea could have implication for algorithm for the assortment under those history monotone models. So this, this is one. The second one, and I think you touched upon this is, so one key assumption of the model is that the customer must reveal their, their ordinal preferences. Um, 
I think it's not clear to me what would be you know, a way to implement this or what would be an application of this. And I think that's something perhaps that, that's worth uh, looking into. And in particular, I think perhaps a utility version of this would be perhaps interesting as well uh, in terms of, in particular, I think one, uh, one thing that, uh, so, so the IC constraint in particular becomes a bit unnatural in the ordinal model, whereas I think it would be very much more natural in the utility version. And so I wonder if, if perhaps there are some implication for this model. And then the last thing that you also mentioned is, is this new IP formulation. I didn't see in the paper any any empirical evidence that 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 you know this is actually you know speeding up um, um, the, the 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 resolution of these IP. But in general, I think that thinking about strengthening of these IP formulation is quite interesting, and so I think this is also a good a good venue for for future research. Um, I think I'm right on time. Thanks so much, Antoine, and thank you, uh, Will, too. <laughs> Um, so it's actually time to start the next talk, but I'll give you one minute, Will, if you want to, uh, you know, chime in on any of the uh, points Antoine made. Of course, we can take this uh, offline uh, on the virtual venue as well. In the meantime, uh, Arnold, would you like to uh, share your slides? Yeah, no, so I just wanted to say, I think uh, Antoine explained sort of the sufficient condition and the thing much better than I ever could. I never figured out how to explain that, so I gave up. But uh, no, Antoine explained it extremely clearly, I thought. So uh, thank you very much, Antoine. And yeah, we'll, we'll chat later. So. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you both. Um, so in the, in the interest of time, we are going to move on to the uh, next one on algorithmic collision for assortment games. Um, Arnaud is uh, the presenter, and this is a joint work with uh, Ali, who is also in the audience. Arnaud, the floor is yours. Yes, thanks. So can you all see my slides? Yes. Yeah. So welcome. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, this is indeed joint work with Ali. Uh, and it is inspired and motivated by an urgent question at uh, competition regulators about collusion and cartels and algorithms. Now, to illustrate their question, consider the following simple scenario. Suppose there are three firms who uh, sell a particular product and say that uh, competitive price is 100 euro. Uh, and the price is determined by their price managers. Now, if then one firm decides to increase the price, that is pr probably not profitable for the firm uh, because the consumers can go to the competition. But if the price managers communicate to each other and all decide to raise their prices, then this may be good and profitable for all firms, but bad for the consumer. But this is uh, the formation of a price cartel, which in most jurisdictions is uh, illegal. Now, it is not illegal to charge 130 euro for a product. Uh, so the high prices in themselves are usually not illegal, at least in most markets in the US and Europe, but it's the communication about it that's against the law. Now, now suppose that the prices are not determined by a human agent, but by an algorithm, not just any algorithm, but an algorithm that learns to form a cartel when it detects similar algorithms in the market. If then the second firm independently purchases or downloads the same algorithm, then the algorithm might learn that it is beneficial to increase the price. And if also the third firm at some moment independently uh, implements the algorithm, then the algorithms may learn to charge higher prices, which is good for the firm and bad for the consumers. Now, as I said, charging a high price in itself is legal. It's only the communication about it that's against antitrust law. But if there is no illegal communication between the algorithms, then according to several experts, this practice would be completely legal. Now, competition regulators are quite worried about this scenario um, because uh, they think perhaps we should change the whole paradigm underlying antitrust law uh, that targets communication and not super competitive prices in itself. Now, interestingly, the topic is also quite controversial. There are uh, quite a few economists who have expressed strong opinions that they believe uh, that this is just science fiction and cannot happen within the next 20 years. So, I mean, I study uh, price algorithms 
since my PhD, I thought it is a nice challenge to see what you can do. Now, today's talk is about assortment games. So I've written two uh, papers on price uh, collusion, but I think it is, uh, makes a lot of sense to study collusion in assortment models. Uh, because, for example, the model settings where uh, you price with a discrete price set, there are models for the fair classes that are offered in airline settings. And with uh, assortment uh, games, you can also include collusion on both price and quality and other attributes of the product, basically. Now, there are not so many papers on assortment optimization with competitions. Uh, here are a few examples. So even without collusion, um, yeah, I think there are still many interesting open questions there. Now, how do you collude? So to collude means to form a cartel or to somehow to uh, behave super competitively together with your cartel friends. There are a number of challenges. The first is, what do we actually mean by collusion? Now, in the 1920s, what you did is you went to some smoke-filled room with your uh, competitors and then you divided the market. But if we cannot communicate, then we somehow have to uh, yeah, agree on something. Um, but there are several definitions possible. And even with com uh, communication, which is against the law, um, there are papers saying that this part, how to divide the market, is usually one of the most difficult uh, challenges that cartels face. Now, I don't know which algorithm my competitor is using. Um, and there's, of course, learning. So the purchase probabilities or the demand function is unknown. You need to learn that. And usually to learn, you need to experiment. But that means that I sometimes deviate from, say, my uh, collusive solution, which my competitor or my cartel friend may interpret as cheating. So we also need to ensure that these cartels are stable. Now, as I said, competition regulators are particularly worried about the scenario where multiple firms in the same market use the same or similar algorithm. And the reason is clear, because that helps a lot for item or for challenge one, two, and four. For example, what it means to collude, you can simply implement in your algorithm. Now, also note, uh, how do you get the same algorithm? If both, uh, if different firms purchase the same algorithm from the same consultancy, who knows about the collusive capabilities of the algorithm, then he may be a bit in a gray area. Um, but if, say, both the firms independently download uh, uh, the algorithm from, the, from some software repository, then it's different. So the liability is, of course, an important issue, but I will not go into there. It's conceivable that there are scenarios that different firms get the same type of algorithm in a legal way. Now, and the goal of this line of research is to try to construct algorithms that learn to collude, so learn to uh, offer supra-competitive assortments with users of the same algorithm in the market without illegal communication. And let me emphasize again that this is completely legal. So the goal is basically to give competition regulators some homework and, uh, and well, Maybe I should say to give them insight because they are quite worried, but they don't really like algorithms is not their natural field of expertise. So uh, they have no clue what these algorithms look like and uh, let alone colluding algorithms. Okay, I want to start with a very simple model, just um, a duopoly. So we have a, a game of two players that choose an assortment, capital S. Uh, in each discrete time period T. So for now, I assume a simultaneous move game, but in the paper, we also consider uh, extensions to kind of sequential move where the move order does not always have to be the same. There are products. So these are the products of firm one, and these are the products of firm two, and they all have a valuation, VIJ, and a price or a marginal revenue denoted by RIJ. Now, we consider an MNL model, so the probability of purchase given the assortments S1 and S2 that lie in some set of feasible assortments that can, uh, of course, uh, have some constraints. Uh, so the probability of purchase is proportional to the valuation, with one being the outside option, and the revenue is just the sum of all the revenues of firm I times the probability of uh, 
saying is that the customer chooses this stock. So that's all standard. Now, in this game, there can exist multiple Nash equilibria that's shown in the paper by uh, Bespes and Sanre. There can exist multiple Nash equilibria, but there's only one Pareto dominant Nash equilibrium. And that has a nice property, namely that if you turnwise play your best response to the assortment of your competitor, then in a few steps, you end up at this Pareto dominant Nash equilibrium. So that's quite nice. But this is, uh, of course, competitive. We're interested in uh, collaborating or colluding. So then the question is, what assortment pair do we uh, think is collusive? Now, a first thing that uh, people usually try is what would the monopolist do? Uh, so monopolist would, of course, maximize the total revenue, but that's not a good uh, idea because this can uh, increase the total revenue, but not the revenue for all firms uh, compared to the Nash equilibrium. So here's an example, uh, two firms, and they all have to offer, say, three out of five products. Well, I just do, generated some valuations and revenues and the same for player two. Then you can compute the Nash equilibrium that's greater dominant. Well, player one offers product one, two, and four. Player two offers product one, two, and five. Um, with corresponding revenues. But if you maximize the monopolist uh, solution, then it turns out that only product one and product two of firm one should be offered, which means that firm two earns nothing. So he will not be happy. Uh, you can, of course, uh, construct many examples like this. So we need to have another solution such that both firms are happy with their collusive solution. And uh, or a solution as this form. So what we do, we try to minimize the revenue uh, over both players relative to some weight, bi, uh, and then we try to maximize this fraction over all feasible assortments. So uh, if bi is one, then we just tr try to maximize the minimum revenue uh, over all pl both players, but we can also say bi is the Nash revenue. So in this example, what I showed, uh, if we compute this solution, then we get a collusive solution where firm one improves 7% and firm two improves 11% compared to their Nash equilibrium uh, revenues. And it's not possible that say firm one improves 8%, that would mean that firm two improves less than 7%. So uh, that's because of the max main structure. Now, and in this example, what they do, they just drop a product. So player one drops product four from the assortment and player two drops uh, product one from the assortment. And they both increase their revenue. Okay, now we have, of course, to compute uh, this object. That's more the domain of knowledge of Ali. But basically you have two results. First, it is that computing uh, this is NP hard, uh, proved by relating it to the set partition problem. But there is an FP test um, for several possible um, standard uh, feasible assortment sets, uh, for example, cardinality constraints, by uh, relating it to existing uh, NAPSEC FP tests. Now that's good. Now we want an algorithm because we want to learn this from data. So the parameters of the model, the VIDAs are unknown. Um, the marginal revenues are of course known. Now, and we consider this scenario um, that competition regulators are worried about. There is collusion if players use the same algorithm. But that's not the only thing we want because Establishing uh, this property is quite easy. Point is, if the competitor uses something else, then you want to learn uh, to play a best response or a good response, depending on what he or she is doing. So we should satisfy both these properties without knowing what algorithm the other player is using. Now, so we're gonna need uh, to learn these parameters. Now, then what is uh, our data? The assortments are product information, both of ourselves and of the competitor. What about the sales data or the purchases? Now, initially, I thought uh, it makes sense to assume that this is private information. Uh, but then we went uh, to do some shopping. 
And it turns out that frequently sellers share their sales data. So uh, here are a few examples. This, this does not happen that often. Here you see eight pieces sold in the last 24 hours. And here this shirt, 56,690 sold. I don't know if that's true. Um, so sometimes firms just make this information public. But this doesn't happen that often. What happens quite often is that people share their inventory level. And there's even quite some literature about uh, the beneficial effect of sharing your inventory level to your uh, consumers. Now, if my competitor shares the stock status, then I can just uh, track that. And each time that inventory decreases, I know that uh, there was a seal. So indirectly, I can infer this data. And this practice is completely legal. Now, that said, um, so that facilitates learning to collude, but we are interested nevertheless in the setting where the sales data remains private. But it's good to know that uh, sometimes sellers are willing for other reasons, I guess, to make this information indirectly available. So we're going to assume that only our own sales data is known to us and not the sales data of the competitor. So that means uh, we have an MNL model. There is at most one purchase per time period. If I have a one, then I know that my competitor has a zero. But if I have a zero, then I don't know if my competitor has a one or also a zero, corresponding to the no purchase option. Now, it turns out that that is uh, not a problem at all. So if I do maximum likelihood estimation based only on the data, so I can even, I can even aggregate my own data. I only uh, count in my Excel file whether I had a purchase or not. I don't even try to uh, uh, figure out what product, of course, look, it's, I think it's more efficient if you take it into account, but you don't even have to do that. If I do maximum likelihood estimation based only on the data, whether I purchase something or not, then you have a nice consistent estimator under mild conditions. So, we have concentration inequality. What does it say? Well, here you see the norm of the distance between some theta hat and theta star. So that is for estimation error. The theta correspond to these valuations. Now, the probability that this is big is small if something else holds, and that is this condition, and that is related to the Fichy information matrix. So the smallest eigenvalue of the Fichy information matrix related to the maximum likelihood estimator should be big. If that is big, then with a uh, high probability, your estimate is good. Now, and how do you make this big? By uh, exploring. Uh, if you always offer the same assortments, then you don't learn. So you have to um, experiment. So basically, our result says if you have sufficient exploration, both players, uh, then we can learn all the parameters consistently based on this partial data. Now, how much is sufficient? Um, slightly more than in the monopolist case. So if you're a monopolist, you also have to explore with your assortments. If I have, uh, and you can do that uh, with n distinct assortments, but in our case, we need one more assortment. So there is, it is possible, there is a small region where you are able to consistently learn the, your own parameters, uh, but not the parameters of your competitor. Okay, so that's good news. So this, this issue of private sales data, which usually is uh, quite a challenge uh, to learn, is in this, because of the structure of the MNL problem is easily uh, overcome. Now, we need to incorporate that in our algorithm. So our algorithm needs three parts, basically. A collusive module, so that basically means we need to learn this collusive assortment and then play it. A competitive module, uh, we also need to do something if you believe that we're not playing against a cartel friend who uses the same algorithm but against a true competitor and then a detection module that is basically some mechanism that determines which of the two i should use now for the collusive module there are many options one option is to be uh, to use epsilon greedy but this is just one option so what can you do with some probability that goes to zero you offer a random assortment from some set of exploration assortments and uh, 
if you don't explore, then you just estimate with maximum likelihood estimation and you offer the estimate your part of the estimated collusive uh, assortment solution. Now, if both players do this, then uh, they will learn. That means their assortment will converge to the, uh, or let me say, the, the revenue that they earn will converge to the revenue earned under the, this collusive notion. So that's good. We also have a regret bound. Now, and so there is a condition. The condition is um, that they explore enough. And what this enough means, uh, so that they explore from a sufficiently rich set of assortments. So that's basically written in the theorem. Uh, and as I said, this is just uh, one example, epsilon greedy. But you can also have that one player uses epsilon greedy as collusive module and the other player uses something else. They're just uh, uh, sufficient conditions that you need to satisfy. And then you can have different flavors basically and still uh, learn. Now then for the competitive module, there are also a lot of things you can do because this is just um, yeah, standard learning in games with uh, incomplete information during in repeated games. One thing, one strategy that I like is uh, just to ignore the competition um, because it's very simple and in many settings it works quite well. So what you do, you just assume there is no competitor. I have my data. Um, yeah, and I, you can use any MNL banded algorithm you like, but this is just one. So let's say again, epsilon greedy, with some probability we offer a random exploration assortment. And if you don't explore, then we estimate the parameters of our monopolist purchase probability, which is completely misspecified model. And nevertheless, we ignore that and we offer the corresponding optimal assortment, uh, the monopoly optimal assortment. Now, the reason why this, uh, so we haven't proven this yet, but the reason why I think this works is that if you converge to, uh, if both players say, I mean, if the competitor's assortment is fixed then, and you use this and you convert to something to what else, then a best response can you converge. And if the competitor's assortment is not fixed, but uh, converges, uh, then in the end, it will be uh, fixed probabilistically speaking, and then to what else can you convert them to a best response? So that's basically the intuition why quite often you can just ignore the competition if you both try to maximize your own profit. Now, and then for the detection module, this is, can also happen in many ways. Let me just, uh, this is not in the paper yet, but let me briefly sketch how you can do this. So you can divide the time horizon in cycles of some length. And then at the beginning of each cycle, you fix your estimated collusive assortment. So no exploration for C time periods. Now, why is that useful? If I uh, see that my competitor is doing this, then I know that he apparently has started to implement this algorithm. So this allows for algorithms to have different starting times. Now, if I observe this structure and uh, so during these beginnings of the cycles, my competitor offers their estimated collusive assortments. I can just see what it is. So in hindsight, I can see, well, is that profitable to me? And if he explores sufficiently uh, uh, to ensure that uh, Emily is consistent, then I play the collusive module during the rest of the cycle and otherwise the competitive. Now, this is one structure that you could use. So basically what you do at the beginning of each cycle, you do a kind of invitation. Uh, so this happens a lot in practice in price competition and there are multiple stores and then one store increases its price to a super competitive level. And then they just see what happens. Sometimes the competitors don't react and then after a while the price drops, but sometimes competitors respond and they also raise their prices. That's called tacit collusion, and there's no communication. And this is uh, basically a related idea. You just do an invitation or a check, see if the opponent follows. And this is completely legal because there is no communication. Now, as I said, such a structure can uh, allow the algorithm to have different starting times, and usually firms do not 
adopt an algorithm at the same time. If you would need that, that would of course need some uh, coordination or communication. Now I say profitable, but you can also be more uh, strict. You can also see well what I what they do in their in the beginnings of their cycles should be the estimated uh, should be uh, the notion of collusion that is implemented. Uh, like or solution this uh, with this max min the problem of course is if my competitor starts later than me then his estimates may be bad so you can also say well it should be uh, something that with uh, estimates in some confidence bound confidence radius around my estimates appears to be so basically he should do be doing his best to uh, try to offer this collusive assortment and there are several ways how you can do this now, you can also even uh, is include uh, cheating detection during the rest of the cycles, but um, I haven't included that in this slide. So, but the high level idea is we have these three modules, collusive, you learn together the collusive uh, solution, collusive assortment, competitive, that's what you would do if you would play against a uh, competitor, and some high level structure above those two, to uh, detect once in a while to check if your competitor uh, is open to pollute, to form a cartel. Now, this is an implementation, a sample path. So I used for the parameters, the VI and the reference, exactly the same values as in this uh, example that I showed you. The time is on the horizontal axis and the revenue is on the vertical axis, scaled so that for both firms, orange and blue, one corresponds to their Nash revenues. Now, eventually, this will converge to uh, so, and I, I plot the scaled uh, average revenue up to so at time four thousand. That means the average revenue up to time four thousand. Because they also randomly explore, otherwise you get a very spiky graph. So eventually, this will converge to one point seven and one point eleven. Uh, that will take some time. Of course, this is just one sample path. But interestingly. Uh, already quite quickly their revenues are above the Nash level. So even if it will take some more time to reach the best le uh, levels, uh, 1.7, 1.11, they already gain from this the moment that they both are above one. Now, this is a simulation, a sample path where both players use this competitive module, uh, ignore the competitor, do epsilon greedy. Epsilon greedy is not the best um, numerically, I think. Um, again, the skilled average revenue, this will eventually convert to one. So that's uh, more or less the structure. Now, there are many things that you could do to extend this, uh, different choice models or all kinds of different structure. One interesting is, of course, to have N players of which M players collude. But this is uh, interesting because uh, the question then is, yeah, what is then a collusive uh, solution? And there are many uh, questions to uh, to answer. Uh, if we do, we have we should take into account that whatever we do, the outsiders will respond. We should ensure that all the members of the cartel are happy and have no incentive to leave. Will not earn more outside the cartel. And if you are familiar with what's called the merger paradox, then this uh, often happens. If you have three firms and two merge, then the third one is better off than before the merger. These kinds of things happen. Should be fair and not that like one uh, firm earns, gains 1% and the other gains 20%, otherwise people may not really like this. It should or should not be open to outsiders because this is a sequentially formed partial cartel people join the cartel once they adopt the algorithm. But that means that it should be beneficial for outsiders to join the cartel. But the problem is that if, you, if it is beneficial for outsiders to join the cartel, that's usually not beneficial for the insiders. So you should uh, think about this. And my impression is that um, uh, sequentially formed partial cartels have not uh, gained that much attention in the literature, not in the assortment, but also not in the price uh, setting. Okay, let me finish um, by conclusion. So basically what we show uh, with our algorithm is that you can 
to learn to collude in an assortment duopoly. Um, hub and spoke, so uh, it's defined, uh, the cartel is defined by users of the same algorithm. There's no illegal communication, so most likely this is completely within the legal framework. You don't need to share your demand data. Algorithms can have different starting times and they can be uh, slightly different. Now, why do I mention this? Because competition regulators are scratching their head what to do. I mean, they, they have to forbid something, but what? Because, so first, they prefer not to change laws. I'm now talking, so I've talked to competition regulators in the Netherlands and also people at the European Commission or links with the European Commission. Changing laws takes forever. So what they would like to do is reinterpret existing laws, which I think is, of course, very smart. But then what should they do? So, well, for example, you can say, well, can you share uh, your inventory data? But in this case, that doesn't help. And they say, well, can we forbid that people use exactly the same algorithm? Well, then software suppliers, uh, yeah, you basically uh, you kill the market of price, price algorithms. But uh, even that wouldn't fix it because they don't have to be exactly the same. On a high level, they have this structure of these three modules. That's it. So competition regulators in the audience have some homework to do. Uh, and let me finish by uh, stating that I read in a nice review of Elon Lobel that uh, ethics and fairness has not received much attention in the revenue management field. So of course, in the recent years, that's changing. So there are several papers and talks about fairness issues and privacy. And basically cartel behavior or desired supra competitive behavior of algorithms also falls in this class and have many uh, interesting open problems and questions. That's what I wanted to share. Thanks for your attention. Thanks so much, Arnold. Um, we have homework for regulators as well as, I guess, the community. Um, so let's move on to Santiago's discussion. And in the chat, you'll see a question. Uh, maybe you'll, you want to take it at the end after Santiago's discussion, or if it's a short answer, you can also use the chat to respond. Um, Santiago will be our discussant. Santiago, the floor is yours. Thanks for discussing this paper. I can see your slides, but it's not. Um, full screen and I think you are muted. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. And I can see the slides full screen. Yes. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Good. Okay. Let me minimize this a little bit. Okay, good. Great. Uh, first, uh, thanks uh, to the organizer for having me as a discussion. I'm very excited to be here. Now, this is a very exciting paper and actually very, it's a fascinating topic and also very relevant uh, for us as a community and in the broader uh, society this is the work of algorithmic collusion in, in assortment games. So the way I want to start before like talking about the paper, let me try to position this paper more broadly in the literature and try to understand what do we mean by algorithmic uh, collusion. And I want to share with you this excellent uh, report by the uh, Organization for Economic and uh, for the Economic Development and, and Cooperation that try to kind of go into this problem of algorithmic uh, collusion. So what is collusion itself? Collusion means joint profit maximization at the expense of consumers. Now, how do we reach and sustain these coll collusive outcomes? We need three components. One is an agreement between the firms on a common policy. Then these firms are going to monitor that everybody else is following this policy. And if not, they're going to punish deviation. For example, using like some price war or any other uh, methods. Now, what's interesting about the law, and this is something that uh, Arnold uh, mentioned, is that the law only prohibits the anti-competitive agreements, but not collusion itself. So then this is like a spectrum of what's legal and what's legal. On one end, over here, you have like a, what is called like explicit collusion, where there is a, like a written or oral 
agreement. So it happened in the past that uh, you had like people meeting in hotel rooms or like in a uh, taxi ride from JFK and they agree on pricing. That's illegal. Now on the other hand, you have like what is called tacit collusion where firms act independently. Now they recognize each other, but they act independently and they reach these collusive outcomes. Now, what's interesting is that from the current perspective, that's uh, legal if there's no uh, agreement. And in between, there is this huge gray area that in many cases where it can happen is that agreements might be inferred even without explicit communication. And this is what this uh, paper uh, tries to look at in a little bit more uh, detail. Now, why now? Why are you looking at collusion now? Well, what happened is that the increased adoption of algorithmic pricing, now using data-driven algorithms to automatically set prices, has increased the risk of anti-competitive behavior. Now, collusion has been always around, but now this is more of, of a concern. Why? Why we have this problem with algorithmic collusion? Well, we have that modern markets are more prone to algorithmic collusion for because of two underlying structural fa factors. First is the frequency of interaction. We have algorithms that are changing prices and interacting all the time. And this is sometimes easier to uh, implement collusive outcomes because you can detect what everybody else is doing and then, for example, quickly punish deviations and then revert to like the collusive prices. And also we have like more market transparency. Now, these are things that are supposed to be good, but can be used by algorithms against consumers. Now you can monitor, as, as Arnold mentioned, you can mon monitor each other prices easy, in any, uh, more easily. Before, again, this would uh, require you going to different store and check prices. And if you're in different market, that can be hard. Now this is something that is, is easier uh, to achieve. And the main takeaway is that here, algorithms can facilitate collusion even without any explicit communication. And remember, the law prohibits communication. And if there's no communication, then potentially this is not illegal under the current uh, framework. Now, types of algorithms, uh, this is something that I, I want to mention so that we can position the current work in the literature. Now, the first type of algorithm that you can think about like, are what is called like parallel algorithms. Now here, what we have is like firms, they develop the algorithm and they share the algorithm with each other. We, these algorithms are explicitly programmed to collude. Now, this is illegal and there was a case 2015, the uh, US versus David Topkins. So he was, he was a seller at Amazon selling posters and he coded an algorithm that was, uh, again, programmed to collude and share this algorithm with other se sellers. So then that was deemed illegal. Now, something of a gray area is, is what is discussed in the current paper that is these have and spoke algorithms. That you still have algorithms that are programmed uh, to collude, but the difference is that you're, you don't have like a firm sharing them with each other, you have like a third party, and it could be like, for example, a repository or analytics uh, consulting firm that develop this algorithm and share this algorithm with the different uh, firms, okay? And because there's no direct communication, then again, one could argue that this is illegal. It's very similar to parallel algorithms because the algorithms are programmed to collude, but there's no direct communication. And there was like in the 90s, some related case where airlines were sharing information indirectly by posting prices. And again, the Department of Justice couldn't rule that as illegal, but again, they reached an agreement and this, they promised not to do it any longer. So even though it's not illegal, again, it's in this gray area and the Department of Justice doesn't like that. And the third, and also like a very uh, interesting idea is this of self-learning algorithms. There are algorithms that they learn to collude on their own. They just solve like kind of some complicated optimization problem and they learn this collusive outcome on their own. They, only, they, they learn to set collusive prices, but only also they learn potentially to penalize deviation with somebody else uh, to a different price. And then in terms of uh, the literature, this is very exciting because it's like lies in the intersection of very uh, the different fields. First, you have like economic, you're talking about pricing, competition, to get machine learning and really management because we have like algorithms making decisions and finally uh, law because at the end of the day, these decisions uh, have to be uh, made by kind of by, uh, by courts. Now, 
in terms of the literature, there's a few papers talking about how and spoke algorithms, and uh, Arnold has done some great work with uh, his colleague. There is this paper, just like another paper that they look at another maximum likelihood estimator, but only with a single product. And also there is just some other work where they design colluding algorithm, but not based on maximum likelihood, but based on like Kiefer Wolfowitz. In this case, it's like simultaneous perturbation stochastic approximation, and they show the possibility of collusion. There's also some work on self learning algorithm. There is a very interesting paper, very recent paper by Calvano et al., uh, 2012 AER, that is an, an empirical paper that what they look at uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. In particular, they look at a Q learning algorithm. The algorithm knows nothing about collusion, but they show that this algorithm may learn to collude on their own. So the way to think about this is very surprising. The way to think about this is that you imagine that you're playing like a repeated game with your competitor, and one solution to this game is to collude, and this may be better than playing the single period Nash equilibrium. So then they learn to collude, and also this algorithm even learn to punish deviation. If they find that somebody is not colluding, then they're going to start a, a price war. There's another paper by, by Hansen et al., uh, Marketing Science, that they look at multi and bandy algorithms uh, competing with each other. They are the difference that you don't observe competitive prices, and also they show that supra competitive outcomes are possible. And also, there is now a classical paper in, in OR by Cooper et al. that shows that firms using monopoly models ignoring competition, and you can still at, attain supra competitive uh, models. Okay? And again, what I want to mention is that. Uh, this, most of these papers in, in the second category are empirical paper. We don't have like a, a good theoretical understanding uh, of when pollution is possible with the exception of Cooper et al. Now, going back to the current paper, what's the model? We have two sellers uh, who offer multiple substitute products. Consumers arrive sequentially over time. We're going to choose which product to buy using an MNL choice model, and the parameters of the choice model are known to the sellers. What are two market outcomes to consider? One is the Nash equilibrium, where each seller is choosing the prices to maximize their own revenue. And then they consider one collusive outcome, that is the egalitarian collusive outcome, that prices are chosen to maximize the minimum relative improvement to the Nash equilibrium. So we agree on a better outcome to the Nash equilibrium. Now, what are the main contributions of this work? First, they show that computing the egalitarian collusive outcome is empty hard. So this seems to be bad news. But then they prove that there is an FP test, so the full polynomial time approximation scheme for computing the collusion outcome. And why is it this is a result that is very important, even though they don't explicitly use it in the paper? Uh, and the best way to explain it is by sharing this quote from Kamal Jain that says, like, if your laptop cannot find it, neither can the market. Now, it happens in other uh, problems. I work a lot, of, for example, in budget pacing. I have like, a great paper by some co authors, Rakitesh Kumar and Christian Kroer that they show in that in those markets, finding an equilibrium is PPAD complete. So there's no, even uh, approximately, it's, it's, it's hard. So then there's no hope to find like even an approximate solution uh, to that problem. And if so, if like, if you cannot find it uh, with a kind of big computer that is very powerful, you wouldn't expect like players to be able to reach it on their own. But this provides in this problem some very good news that potentially collusive outcomes uh, are attainable. Good news for firms, perhaps not good used for regulators and consumers. They present the satisfying epsilon greedy policy. It's a very intuitive policy. What it, what it does is they explode with some probability. So when I choose a random affirmant, and otherwise it explodes. It chooses the uh, maximum likelihood estimator and choose a, a collusive assortment based on your best estimate at that point. And the result is that they show that simultaneous adoption leads to vanishing regret relative to uh, collusive outcome. Now, what are strengths of this work? Now, the model is very general because if you consider the case of multiple uh, products with constraints, they can accommodate pricing and affirming competition. So it's a quite the general model. They have a very clever maximum likelihood estimator that only uses aggregate observation. Now, I want to uh, emphasize this because the maximum likelihood estimation, the, the naive one, we use, we require all the information, even information about your competitors, by looking at this simple estimator, actually uh, you can develop more practically relevant algorithms that use like less information, essentially the information that is available in, in practice. And actually this is one of the few papers that establish the possibility of pollution analytically. No? So then most of the work 
so far have been empirical. Now, what are potentially areas of improvement? Now, the ML model, again, is a very popular, it's a workforce model of revenue management, but we know that it has like some limitations. It cannot accurately capture many other solution patterns. Now, perhaps can we study other demand models? This will be an interesting feature of the research direction. Also, uh, as, as Arnold mentioned, now firms need to agree on the cooperative model of bargaining. And there are many other models of bargaining, and uh, natural solution, they talk about that in the paper too, but Kalai's model is key, and there are many other Pareto optimal outcomes that can be uh, achieved. Now, which collusive outcome is appropriate? I think that we need more research to understand this, and also how would firms even agree on certain collusive outcomes? And then, uh, in the paper, in the preliminary version of the paper, I think that this is fixed with the version they presented uh, today, but in the, pre in the preliminary version of the paper, firms were using like this simple policy, and it was not an equilibrium in the sense that firms might have incentives uh, to deviate. Now, if somebody deviates, or if, I'm, if, if I know that using this, this algorithm, perhaps I can underprice you, I can undercut you, and then uh, do better. And then we need perhaps like more sophisticated notion of regret, such as policy regret, that is used like a multi-agent performance learning to study like kind of uh, the, the outcome and the performance of the algorithm. So again, just to wrap it up, I know that we are running out of time. So increased adoption of algorithms can lead to collusive outcomes. And because algorithms do not involve communication, then it is currently uh, not unlawful. Now, the first takeaway is competition law needs to adapt, but how? Now, in many cases, if you use, for example, a self-learning algorithm that is using a neural net, these algorithms are not interpretable. So how can we say that this algorithm is uh, colluding? Also, we cannot hold algorithms uh, liable. Uh, there is a science paper that says, like, well, perhaps what we can try to do is we need to audit and test this algorithm control environment to find if you are colluding or not. But then in practice, this is going to be hard to, to implement. And then there are many exciting research directions. Now, when do self-learning algorithms converge to collusive outcomes? How can regulators perhaps detect or prevent uh, collusion? And also, it's an interesting connection to dynamic games that people in econ have been studying collusive outcomes, not a solution as a static game, where there you don't want to collude. But if you think about like a repeated game uh, with discounting, then you can show that these collusive outcomes naturally emerge. And perhaps what this algorithm is trying to do is trying to find uh, this, this uh, subgame perfect uh, Nash equilibria in the record. Okay, and with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much, Santiago. Thank you so much. Um, actually, let me thank all, both uh, speakers and both discussants. This has been a really interesting session, at least for me. Uh, now, um, Arnold, uh, uh, I didn't ask the question in the chat. Um, and um, I, I was actually thinking that perhaps it is better if you went back to the virtual venue and um, answered that question and you know had the additional um, discussion over there. But if you want, if you have a brief answer to that, perhaps you can just do that and then we can move to the venue. It's up to you. Yes, we need to move through this poster in this gallery town, right? Or... Yeah, exactly. So basically, when we when we close the uh, Zoom session, um, we can just return back to the virtual venue and. Um, in room A, at the bottom of the room, there is a dedicated space for discussions for both papers. Yes. Is Aiden still here? Um, yep, I'm here. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So uh, what do you say to the regulator? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's very difficult. I think that well, I think that algorithmic collusion between two different algorithms is very difficult to get. Mm. But I think that algorithmic collusion with the same or similar algorithms are from the same source, basically, is not difficult. It's challenging, but uh, yeah, you can uh, make that. And the problem is that, uh, like, people say, well, should we do an algorithm audit? The problem is, is that it is completely legal because it is also illegal if I'm a human agent and I raise my price just to see what happens. That intention uh, to, to get super competitive uh, outcomes is legal. An algorithm is just uh, a sophisticated way to compute uh, how much I should raise my price or these things. 
it's not really about the algorithm in that regard. It's just about the fact that these intentions are legal and you cannot uh, make that illegal easily or that has a lot of consequences. Uh, second question, would your detection stand in the court of law? Yeah, so the thing is with these things, you only know it when there has been a case. Mm -hmm. um, so I've talked to a lawyer and to uh, professors in competition law and they, uh, uh, because I wanted to be sure that uh, I make something within the law and it's not something that is already illegal. But uh, so I uh, could convince them or they could convince me that uh, this is legal. Um, but um, if there would be a case, then of course competition regulators would try their best to find some reason uh, to punish this. Um, but if they would succeed, yeah, that depends on the case. I don't really know. Right. Great, so, uh, thank you. Thank let you. Me briefly interject, Ali, I know that you have a, a comment as well, but if you don't mind, let's go back together, Town, and uh, continue the discussion there, because I suspect that there might be folks who want to ask questions to Will as well. Um, so instead of Zoom, let's continue over there. Thank you all for this, uh, for attending the session and excellent presentations and discussions.